Welcome everyone to Biostatistics and Biomedical Research Session 8 and Happy New Year. Uh, today we're going to be comparing two proportions which uh, should seem like one of the simplest things to do in statistics but uh, as we'll see there's a lot more to it and in the frequentist world uh, there are several issues with regard to um, inability to get truly exact uh, calculations. Um, as always, um, turn on the live uh, chat if you're participating during the premiere of this recording. Otherwise, use uh, the uh, data methods resource for asking questions and continuing the discussion. The notes I'll be showing were last updated on uh, January 2nd, 2020. So let's set the stage for comparing two proportions. Um, and so our goal is to compare dichotomous independent variables with a dichotomous outcome. And so our grouping variable can be considered as an independent variable. And the independent variable might be exposed versus not exposed, treated versus control, knockout mouse versus a wild type mouse in a genetic experiment, and so on. And then our outcome variable is going to be uh, dichotomous also, and it might indicate diseased or not diseased, uh, or any yes or no outcome, an outcome that has exactly two levels. Now it's frequently um, practiced that a continuous or ordinal outcome is dichotomized for analysis just to make it simple, uh, and this is truly a bad idea. Uh, and instead of using the methods in this chapter, uh, you should consider using a t-test, uh, as was discussed previously, or non-parametric methods that will be discussed in an upcoming session. So we start with the comparison of two proportions. What is the proportion of the outcome uh, in group 1 versus group 2, or sample 1 versus sample 2? So we're going to assume that we have two independent samples and our sample size for sample 1 is N1 and the sample size for uh, the second sample is N2. The population probabilities of interest that we don't know but would like to estimate are P1 and P2. And then our sample estimates of those probabilities are going to be having the hats on them, so P1 hat and P2 hat. And in the frequentist world, uh, we often set up a null hypothesis, H0 P1 equals P2 equals some common probability P. Now, uh, the normal approximation uh, test for comparing two proportions involves variances of the proportions. The variance of a proportion is equal to the true probability of the outcome times 1 minus the probability divided by the sample size in that group. Um, and so if you uh, are constructing a test statistic for comparing two proportions, you might automatically think that you need to get a standard error for the difference in proportions, and we start with the variance, the, the square of that. The variance of the difference in two proportion is just the sum of the variances, and under the null hypothesis, the P1 and P2 are the same, we call it P, and so our variance of the difference in two proportions is P times 1 minus P, multiplied by the sum of the reciprocals of the sample size. This will look familiar to what we were doing with the two sample t-test. Now we estimate uh, the value of p uh, by plugging in our individual estimates and the pooled proportion, uh, which under the null hypothesis is a good estimate, um, is just a weighted average of the two separate proportions and the weights are the sample sizes. So you see this simple weighted average and that gives us our pooled probability under the null hypothesis P1 equals P2. And so that gives rise to a fairly simple test statistic. You take the difference divided by the standard error of that difference, which is the square root of the variance of the difference, that we just uh, went over, and so this gives you a Z statistic, which is a uh, something for large samples, has a normal distribution, and we can look at the tail areas of that normal distribution to get approximate p-values for comparing the two groups. 
So we're going to see how likely it is to obtain a z-value as far or farther out in the tails of the normal distribution than the observed z that we just calculated. Now there is a continuity correction you can make, uh, but we don't really recommend doing that. So let's take an example. Uh, we're going to test whether the population of women whose age at first birth was 29 or younger has the same probability of breast cancer as women whose age at first birth was 30 or more. Now you can see from the way this problem is set up, it's sort of a trick problem because uh, we should not be dichotomizing age. There's nothing magical that happens with biology right at age 30. Any effect of age is very, very likely to be very continuous um, until you knew more about, say, hormonal changes or other physiology, but not knowing that, it's going to be a smooth function of age. So this dichotomi dichotomization of age is a mistake, uh, but we're going to stick with it just for purposes of illustration. Um, now, you could have a case control study where the independent and dependent variables are interchanged, so we usually think of uh, the cancer as the outcome variable, but here cancer is the conditioning variable. It's the variable that you sample on. So we're going to get a sample of women without cancer and a sample of women with cancer, and we're going to look at the ages. So it's as if age is the dependent variable. That's, that's what a case control study looks like. So instead of looking at the probabilities of cancer by the different age groups, we can look at the probability of being at or above 30 years of age as a function of whether you had cancer or not. Uh, so the probability of age being greater than or equal to 30 is 0.212 in the no cancer in the cancer group and 0.146 in the no cancer group. And our pooled probability, uh, which you can get instead of getting the proportions and weighting them by the sample size, you can just add up all of the positives here and divide by the total sample size. So the weighted average of these two numbers here is 0.162. We can estimate the variance using the formula we had above, and that gives us 5.5 times 10 to the minus fifth, and the square root of that is 0 0.007. So that's a measure of precision of our uh, estimating the difference of two proportions. So our test statistic is going to be the difference in the proportions uh, divided by the standard error, which is 8.85, which is a very, very high uh, Z statistic. And this will give us a two-tailed p-value uh, less than 10 to the minus fourth. And this is the R code for getting that calculation done uh, in kind of a manual fashion without using any special uh, chi-square test uh, function. And you can see you get your two proportions and the pooled standard error, the Z statistic, and the p-value, which is very, very small for this case. Now, we're not using a t-distribution uh, because you use a t-distribution when you have an error variance to estimate. There's no error variance in this binary problem when a, with a binary uh, dependent variable. And the, the variance of the proportion is a function of the unknown probability. There's not a separate type of residual variance that operates independently of the mean or, or probability you're estimating. That's why we're not using a t-distribution, and that's why we don't have denominator degrees of freedom. Uh, so now we're going to get into a different way of, of obtaining the same result, which is writing this down as a 2 by 2 contingency table or frequency table. Um, now the z that we just calculated, if that has a normal distribution, uh, the square of it has a chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom, uh, and the one means you're testing a single difference against zero. Now if we arrange it in the 2 by 2 contingency table, we see the numbers shown here, and there is a general way to think about uh, a contingency table chi-square, which is taking the difference between observed and expected frequencies squared divided by expected frequencies. And the, the way that you calculate expected frequencies under a null hypothesis is given below. And this is really a traditional way to learn uh, 
certain types of goodness of fit or chi-square contingency test statistics, I don't think it's n normally that helpful to learn this approach because it doesn't really generalize to more complex cases that we're going to typically encounter. Uh, so for those who are interested can go through this, um, but instead of actually calculating the expected and plugging in the formula above with the summation, this is the formula that uses the four frequencies. And you can see you, you take A times D minus B times C. That difference in squared is a key quantity uh, that goes into this overall Pearson chi-square test statistic. And here we get a chi-square of 78.37. Now that is exactly the square of the Z statistic. So the method that we're using before which is using a large sample approximation of having a normal distribution is really doing the same thing as this chi-square calculation from the table. So um, you can see how you can use uh, software to get the calculations given um, the frequency table. You could also do it as a function of raw data. and um, we are getting a Pearson chi-square test and not allowing it to do a continuity correction. We'll talk more about that later. Um, and then we're also using simulation to get a more exact p-value. Um, and so the, um, the approximate p-value is 10 to the minus 16th. Uh, I think I said it was less than 10 to the minus 4th before. It's actually much less than that. And using simulation uh, based on only a million replicates, we have 10 to the minus 6. Doesn't really matter in this case, but sometimes you may want to do the simulation. Um, so one thing to understand about the chi-square uh, statistic that we look up to get the p-value is you're looking at the right tail of the chi-square distribution. You're seeing how likely it is it, is it to get chi-squares that were that were bigger than what you calculated from your own observed data. Um, and so the, the chi-square is, is a non-directional test because it's taken the, square, the difference in square that you lose the sign. So even though you're operating in one tail of the chi-square, it's still a two-tailed test uh, because it would involve both, both tails of the z before you squared it. So this is called the ordinary Pearson chi-square test without a continuity correction. There is another way to get uh, p-values from um, two by two and bigger contingency tables, which Fisher called uh, the exact test. It's not actually a very good name for the test, um, but because it doesn't really give exact p-values. Um, what it means by the word exact is that the type 1 error from the procedure used by Fisher's exact test will not exceed the stated level. It may be much smaller than the stated level, so when you're actually using Fisher's exact test, that's why it loses power. It gives p-values that are too big. Um, it's also a misnomer in that it's not testing the original hypothesis that you test when you're comparing two proportions. So when you're comparing two proportions, uh, unlike the case control study we just saw, uh, we're usually going to have a cohort study or a randomized experiment, and we'll be comparing the two proportions. We have their numerators, we have their denominators, um, and the numerators are free to be observed at any values. Whereas Fisher's exact test is conditioning uh, as if you could have predefined the total number of deaths in a mortality study, the total of the deaths in group one and group two combined, because Fisher's exact test conditions on that margin, it conditions on the total number of events. And really, we really, in comparing two groups, we really want an unconditional test that doesn't treat the total number of events as a constant. Um, now, the ordinary Pearson chi-square works fine, which is, makes it very curious why the Fisher's exact test is so popular, because Pearson's is much, much faster to compute. Um, 
and Pearson actually made a comment that he thought the the calculations using his test would be accurate only if all the expected frequencies are greater than five. He never actually stopped to check if that's the case, and they really don't have to be um, greater than five. They could be greater than one. Um, and so he started a rumor that actually wasn't checked for many decades, and now we know that number five is, is not correct, and the ordinary test works extremely well. And we don't use the Yates continuity correction on uh, the Pearson chi-square test because it was developed to make the normal approximation yield p-values that are more similar to Fisher's test. And that test is conservative. The p-values are too big. So we really don't want to do that. Um, now, it's, I mentioned at the outset of today's session that um, there are more, more to this than meets the eye in terms of getting p-values from the simplest sort of 2 by 2 table for associating two binary variables. And this has really um, been struggled with by statisticians for many decades um, in the attempt to get exact unconditional p-values and to get a unique test for a 2 by 2 table. We really have probably dozens of different tests you can do, there's not a unique choice. Um, and by contrast, uh, when you do a Bayesian 2x2 uh, two two table, uh, you're getting posterior probabilities for the true unconditional quantity of interest. You're not conditioning on the total number of events in the two, two treatment arms. Uh, so why does the Bayesian method give you more straightforward calculations given that you have prior distributions um, and how does it do it with such ease? Well, it's because uh, we're talking about a categorical outcome variable. A categorical outcome variable can assume only a limited number of values in the case in this chapter is just two um, and so that means the sample space is discrete when you're enumerating all the samples that could have been observed under the null hypothesis, uh, you can't get every possible value uh, because these are all integer valued uh, variables. Um, and so the frequentist method has to use the sample space in the calculation. The sample space is discrete, it has ties in it uh, when the response variable is categorical and that keeps you from observing every possible p-value. Uh, Bayes never considers the sample space, it considers the parameter space, and the parameter space, such as the difference in risk or the odds ratio, is almost always continuous. So it doesn't have that same discreteness to wor worry about. That's why you get exact calculations. Uh, I would refer you to this long discussion on stats.stack exchange. Uh, there's some uh, great points here, a lot of references and it explains why Pearson's chi-square is accurate even with expected frequencies as low as one and it explains sometimes a little uh, tiny correction you make to, to Pearson's chi-square to make it work uh, exceptionally well. So we're going to turn to some sample size issues, power for comparing two independent samples. As you might guess, as the, is the case with every statistical test, the power is going to increase as the sample sizes go up. Uh, the power, just as with a two-sample t-test, it's usually the case by comparing two proportions that the power is going to be optimized when the sample sizes are the same. That's not universally true, but it's, it's a good starting point. Uh, the power goes up as the difference in the two true probabilities goes up, that's our delta, and power will go up if you allow type 1 error to go up. Uh, so there's a lot of approximate formulas for power um, and there's a lot of software to make this really easy. So let's take an example for, for getting a power in a sample size calculation. We are dealing with an infection in a certain narrow population and we think that with the current uh, therapy, uh, the population is free of infection. Half, half the population is free of the infection um, within a day. Uh, and if we add a new drug to the standard of care, we expect to increase the percentage of infection-free uh, 
uh, 2.7. So if we randomly sample 100 subjects to receive standard care, 100 to receive the new therapy, what's the chance of detecting a, a difference? Um, it should not say significant difference, but it should just say difference here between the two therapies at the end of the study. So our probabilities that we're talking about is our starting point of 0.5 and then if we could improve the uh, cure probability to 0.7 and the sample size was 100 in each group, what would be the power? Well the power of that comparison would be 0 0.83 if alpha is set to 0 0.05 and in the HMIS package in R a very simple calculation. You just give it the the two two probabilities. So we're trying to detect a 0.2 increase off of a 0.5. We give it the two sample sizes and this is the power that you get. Now you can also compute the sample size to achieve uh, a given uh, power and so um, the sample size is going to go down when you allow the power to go down uh, the sample sizes go down typically when your two sample sizes are equal the total sample size will go down the sample size needed for a certain power is going to go up as the true difference goes up um, or as you allow the type 1 error to get larger so the required sample size is a function of both P1 and P2 and so let's do an example uh, we have a baseline probability of cancer in a certain population of 0 0.0015 and we'd like to detect a 0.8 fold decrease in the probability of cancer and so taking 0.8 and multiplying it by 0 0.0015 you get 0 0.0012 and if we set our type 1 error to 0 0.05 and our type 2 error to 0 0.2 which is quite high um, we find that we need 235,000 individuals in each of the two groups to have only a 0.8 chance of detecting a difference that's this small. So this is how you might calculate that with the HMIS package in R. We give it the two uh, probabilities. We're comparing uh, the alpha and the power and this is the answer that we just quoted. Now we turn to confidence interval for a difference in two proportions. What we're going to be talking about is just the simple normal approximation type of confidence interval. There's some much more complicated confidence intervals. Uh, they're still approximate, but they, they're, they're more accurate than the ones we're presenting here. So this is the assuming large sample, and so you have approximate normality, and uh, the 1 minus alpha two-sided confidence limit for the unknown difference in probabilities is going to have at the center of it the difference in the observed proportions of events. Then we're going to have plus or minus z, such as 1.96 if alpha is 0.05, times our uh, standard error. Now you notice here we're not using the pooled probability because when you're calculating a confidence interval, um, you want that confidence interval to be valid more than just at a point. So you don't want to assume the null hypothesis is true when you're calculating a confidence interval. So we have both the P1 and P2 here and their own sample sizes. Um, and so it's a pretty simple formula and it's accurate enough um, when n is um, you know close to 100 or something. Um, you can also um, invert this formula uh, to get a confidence interval for the number needed to treat to say to save one life um, or to save one case of disease. So the number needed to treat which has some very serious problems with it as a, an effect measure is just the reciprocal of these so you can um, take the reciprocal of the endpoints uh, to get a confidence interval for the reciprocal of the difference in risk, in other words for the number needed to treat. That's really, uh, there's problems with doing it that way and there's a reference uh, or uh, a link here for more discussion. Um, 
but uh, that is a very uh, quick and dirty way to get a confidence interval for a number needed to treat. The confidence interval will be so wide you'll be pretty frightened and it will probably make you uh, stop quoting number needed to treat. Now what about uh, sizing a study not for a more arbitrary effect to detect and using a power calculation, but using uh, precision? So I really favor uh, designing studies for precision more often than for power. It's a more general concept. It's also easier to do. So we're planning to study so that the margin of error is sufficiently small. The margin of error is half the width of the confidence interval in the frequentist world. Um, and so for two proportions, the uh, margin of error is just uh, what we plus, plus or minus in that formula we just had for the confidence interval. So we have something like 1.96 here times this square root. And so, but how do we um, get a margin of error before a study's done and we don't know P1 and P2. Um, well, before answering that question, let's consider uh, some advantages of the approach. Uh, so we know that if you power a study to detect a very large difference and all you get is a clinically important difference, uh, you may be left with nothing and the confidence interval may be so wide that you can't rule out either a very large or a very small effect. Um, and so if you base the sample size on the margin of error instead of on power, this can lead to a study that gives you scientifically relevant results, even if the results are not statistically significant or so-called statistically significant. So here's an example. We have an infection risk in a population is 0.5, and a reduction to 0.4 is, to, is believed to be a large enough reduction that would lead to a change in procedures or drugs. We're going to plan a study of a new treatment, and we're going to enroll enough subjects so then the margin of error in estimating the difference in probabilities is 0.05. So let's consider some outcomes before we show actually how to do the calculations. Let's suppose uh, the observed decrease in infection was 0.06 and the confidence interval for the decrease was 0.11 to 0.01. So the confidence interval does not contain zero. So in the old way of thinking, uh, you would say before, before we're alerted to all the problems with uh, null hypothesis testing and using confidence intervals in this way, that we have some indirect evidence um, that the new treatment is effective at reducing infections. Um, zero is not in the confidence interval, which is a pretty dangerous way of thinking, but um, still we're generating some level of evidence for a positive reduction in the infection probability. We also see that point 0.1 that we originally thought would be a worthwhile uh, reduction to detect is within the confidence interval uh, limits. Now what if the new treatment is observed to decrease infection by only 0.04 and the confidence interval is 0.09 down to minus 0.01 so we don't have enough evidence to reject the supposition that there's no effect of treatment. Notice how many negatives you have to use in the no hypothesis testing world. If we're tied to an arbitrary alpha of 0.05, uh, but the confidence interval does not contain 0.1, so indirectly we could rule out a scientifically or a clinically relevant decrease in infection. So confidence interval does give us more information than a p-value for sure. Now, how do we do a sample size calculation for precision? Well, it's easier in the case where n1 is equal to n2, and then we consider the worst case. So what makes the variance of a proportion be at its worst? It's, it's when the proportion is at maximum uncertainty, which is when you're flipping a coin, the probability is, is 0.5. Uh, so, but this is the variance formula that we're dealing with if only we knew P1 and P2. Um, so, but it simplifies when there's only this one value of P and this one value of N. Uh, 
And so the variance of the difference in two proportions in that case is this. So this is uh, the worst case. So this is the, the largest, uh, I'm sorry, this is a general case if the p's are the same and the n's are the same. But how do we get a uh, bound on that? Well, we do a worst case analysis. So the worst case of the variance is when the, both of the variances are equal or, or, or with p is equal to 0.5 for our probabilities. Um, and so this is the variance uh, when the n's are equal and the p's are equal. That will have its maximum value when p is equal to 0.5 and that maximum value is 1 over 2n. Uh, and so you can solve for delta, the margin of error, in that case by multiplying it by the critical value. So this is using uh, 0.95 confidence interval. And so 1.96 times the square root of this worst case variance for the difference in two proportions gives us our worst case margin of error. So if we size the study in, with n in each group, um, we will ensure that the margin of error is no worse than delta. It is likely to be better than delta because our, our probabilities are probably not going to be right around 0.5. So we solve for the sample size and we get 1.92 over delta squared. So once you set the acceptable margin of error for estimating the difference in two probabilities, then you can get the sample size. So that gives you the number uh, needed in each group to obtain a margin of error of delta. Uh, for a margin of error of 0.05, uh, n needs to be 768 in each group. Uh, well, this is a little bit scary, so just to nail down the difference in two probabilities to within a margin of error of plus or minus 0.05, we need 768 subjects in two groups. Uh, it's, it's quite scary, and you think about all of the work that's being done with machine learning and genetics where the sample sizes in certain cells of the data are much smaller than this, where you can't even estimate the difference in two very simple proportions, but the authors of the paper claim that you can get some very fancy uh, accurate estimates using hundreds or thousands of variables, it's really impossible to do that. Um, so this just goes through the calculations using R. Um, and so you can see that this is very easy to do. And then you remember the universal rule about margins of error is that whenever you have a margin of error that's half as big as what you just calculated, the sample size needs to be four times bigger. Um, if your margin of error was uh, going to be uh, twice a 0.05 or 0.1, uh, the sample size goes down by a factor of 4. Uh, and so we would um, we can use that universal rule for estimating margin of error uh, with any sort of multiple of the sample size we originally calculated. Next, we turn to relative effect measures um, because we're going to need to talk about odds ratios for testing uh, differences in a different way, uh, especially as we start to use multivariable models. So we've been dealing with absolute risk differences, P1 minus P2, but there are rel relative effect measures. The most common are risk ratio and odds ratio. Uh, Risk ratios are easy to interpret, but that's only because they have a zero order problem. Um, and the risk ratio is going to be drastically altered if you change which outcome is your event and you use the complementary outcome. Um, and the risk ratio is also has this uh, really fundamental problem that it cannot stay constant for long. So you can see that uh, by, by looking at examples like this. You have a risk factor that doubles your risk of lung cancer. That risk factor simply cannot apply to a subject having a risk above 0 0.5 uh, uh, because if you double the risk, you'll get a probability of lung cancer greater than 1, and that will be impossible. Uh, 
So the fact that a risk ratio cannot stay constant over a very wide range of risk uh, is a good reason not to use it if you have any sort of range at all. Um, odds ratios, on the other hand, can apply to, to any subject. And it's very common in a clinical trial with a binary outcome that the main result is stated in terms of odds ratios. Uh, because an odds ratio can be constant, it can apply to uh, subjects outside of the clinical trial uh, without knowing so much about them. So what is an odds ratio? Well, you first you have to know what an odds is. So in group one, the odds of the event happening is P1 divided by 1 minus P1. So that is uh, the amount of probability in favor of the event happening divided by the amount of probability against the event happening. And that's just the odds. You do the same thing for group two. You get the odds of the event in group two. And then the ratio of those odds is the odds ratio. So you can see that's much more complicated than, than uh, P1 minus P2 or P1 divided by P2, but we'll see why it's worth it. Uh, note that if you want to test the null hypothesis that the odds ratio is equal to 1, that's really equivalent to testing whether P1 is equal to P2. For just for getting p values, the choice of scale doesn't matter too much, but we'll say more about that later. Uh, there are formulas for getting confidence intervals for odds ratios. And now, this is really a key point to understand. Now, what makes a probability unstable? A probability is unstable uh, when, the, when it's close to 0.5. So that's when the variance of a proportion is maximum, is when you're at the maximum uncertainty point of a probability of 0.5. Uh, and so we saw that from the variance formula p times 1 minus p. Now what about the variance of an odds? Well that really instead of having p times 1 minus p in the numerator, it has p times 1 minus p in the denominator. Now that means the odds are going to be unstable when the risk is very close to 0 or close to 1. So we have the opposite problem with odds ratios. They're unstable their variance goes way up as you move farther from 0.5. So it's the exact opposite prop properties of a proportion. Um, you'll see the effect of that in a moment. So we can compute confidence limits for odds ratios by anti-logging the confidence limits for log odds ratios. Um, and the variance I mentioned a moment ago that has p times 1 minus p in the denominator is really the variance of a log of the odds. Now, in the case where both of the, the probabilities are small, but not tiny, uh, and the ends are the same, the standard error of the log odds ratio is approximately the square root of 42.1 over n. Uh, so if you think your probabilities are not going to be smaller than 0.05 or larger than 0.95, you can use that formula uh, to get the standard error of the log odds ratio. Uh, the common sample size n needed to estimate the true odds ratio to within a factor of 1.5 is 984 when the p's are in the range of 0.05 to 0.95. What about for a range of sample sizes and values of p? Well, we can calculate this in general, and there's some code here that does that, and then we plot this. So you see this graph it is showing the relationship between the sample size on the x-axis and the multiplicative margin of error for the odds ratio on the y-axis. Now remember we are getting the standard error of the log odds ratio and then we can get a confidence interval for the uh, log odds ratio and then anti-log those two limits to get the confidence interval for the odds ratio the ratio of the upper confidence limit to the point estimate of the odds ratio is the multiplicative margin of error, which is just the anti-log of the margin of error on the log scale. And likewise, how do you get, how do you go from the point estimate to the lower confidence limit? Well, if you took the ratio of the point estimate of the odds ratio to the lower confidence interval, well, 
uh, you'll also get the same thing, which is your multiplicative margin of error. Now notice how the multiplicative margin of error can be really, really bad. So this says that you're off by a factor of 100 uh, when you're talking about confidence intervals uh, of 0.95 intervals. Um, now this is for the case uh, where your probability of the event in the two groups can get very small. This is 0.02. So when you're talking about a rare outcome, the odds ratios can really blow up on you. And you see that it takes a very large sample size uh, to get a margin of error multiplicative of uh, 1.5. You're going to have to look way out here, get 2,000 subjects in each of the two groups to get a decent uh, multiplicative margin of error if you have very rare events. But if you have very common events, that's 0.5. Um, a sample size 10, you can get a multiplicative margin of error that's less than 10. Sample size 50, it's getting in the range of about a, a multiplicative margin of error or fold change of 2. And it's just dropping after that. So a lot easier in the case of common events but you can use this graph to estimate the sample size you need if you have some rough limits on the two probabilities that are underlying the calculations. But beware, uh, because if you are saying that you can nail down an odds ratio to within a multiplicative margin of error because your sample size, uh, let's say you're dealing with this curve here and your sample size is less than 100, and your margin of error is looking like between 3 and 4, that's not very good. And so a lot of studies in the literature didn't pay enough attention to this, and they actually have very unstable odds ratios. They haven't nailed it down to within a decent full change margin of error. So let's go through an example and work through it in some detail. Uh, our study is uh, a study involving patients who are undergoing coronary artery bypass graft surgery, a very common type of surgery for occlusive uh, coronary artery disease. There's a risk associated with open heart surgery. And let's, su let's suppose that the patient population we're studying is not just your general population, but let's suppose these are very elderly patients or patients with depressed heart function. Um, and we're going to ask the question, do the emergency cases, so the patients who were, say, more unstable, uh, or they're like actively having a heart attack, uh, do those emergency cases have a surgical mortality that is different from the more standard uh, cases, the non-emergent cases? And so we're, we have two population probabilities of interest. We have the probability of death in patients with emergency priority and the probability of death in patients who are not the emergent patients. So our statistical hypotheses are H0 P1 is equal to P2, which is the same as saying the odds ratio is 1. The alternative hypothesis is the two probabilities are not the same uh, or the odds ratio is not equal to 1. Those are really equivalent whether you're talking about risk or odds ratio. So let's step back and suppose we didn't have the data, but we could plan a study. What sort of power or sample size what are we talking about? So let's say there's prior research that shows that just over uh, 1 out of 10 of sur surgeries in this high-risk patient population uh, ends in an operative death, and the researchers would like to be able to detect a threefold increase in risk. Now, you should be very questioning at this stage because is is this variable a very objective variable, emergency versus not? And also, why would you want to test a null hypothesis? Wouldn't you be more interested in estimating the operative risk for emergency versus non-emergency cases? Why do we need a null hypothesis? But let's just play along for now. Uh, now, we're going to assume that emergency surgeries are much more rare uh, than non-emergency in a 10 to 1 ratio. Um, so let's suppose that what we'd like to be able to detect with a power of 0.9, a halfway decent power, uh, is the base risk of 0.1 going up for the emergency cases to 0.3. So we have an increase in risk of 0.2. So what are the sample sizes uh, for uh, 
uh, those and other combinations of P1 and P2. Now this is using uh, power and sample size software that by uh, DuPont and Plummer that uh, comes from Vanderbilt University, freely available on the web. Uh, so let's suppose you had the configuration that we really had before, which is uh, a difference of uh, 0.1 going up to 0.3 risk of death for emergency cases. Uh, and we're going to restrict the sample sizes to be in a, a ratio of 10 to 1 because that's how they're going to come in to the hospital. So if that were the case, you could detect this difference with a probability of 0.9, uh, having 40 emergency cases and 400 uh, non-emergency cases. If you wanted to detect a difference of 0.2, um, but the probabilities were creeping up high, closer to 0.5, there's more uncertainty, the sample size goes up. If you wanted to detect very large relative differences that turned out to be very small absolute differences, the sample sizes go way up. If you wanted to detect a 0.7 to 0.9 shift, well, that's symmetric with this one. So remember, our formulas uh, involve p times 1 minus p, so it's going to be symmetric in uh, p and 1 minus p. Uh, we can use the uh, B SAM size function in the HMS package in R, um, and we can have this uh, sample size uh, fraction uh, put into the calculations and we see 40 and 399, virtually the same that was obtained here. And we can compare 0.4 and 0.2 to detect a 0.2 difference, and we get 56 and 561, almost the same we got with PS, and likewise for the other uh, situations. Now, we're out of the planning stage, and we have some collected data, and we have these emergency cases where uh, 6 died and 19 lived, getting open heart surgery, and for the non-emergency cases, we had 11 died and 100 alive. So we have two probability estimates using the two proportions, 6 out of 25, so 0.24 probability of dying if you get emergency surgery, 0.1 probability of dying if, you get, if you're not an emergency case. Now what about a statistical test for the difference in those two? Uh, well, we can uh, write down our data like this instead of having the raw sort of 0, 1 data. And we can calculate our odds ratio. So the emergent cases have uh, 2.87 times our, our fold increase in the odds of death from the surgery. The standard error of the log of the odds ratio is the square root of the sum of these two variances. And the variances have the P1 and P1. 1 minus P1 in the denominators, you see the division here, instead of in the numerators. So that's how you get um, the variance and the standard error for the dip for the odd, log odds ratio. And we'll have to analog that to get our confidence intervals on the original odds ratio scale. So this is just a way an R of saying plus or minus. And so our 0.95 confidence interval for the odds ratio of emergency to non-emergency uh, mortality goes from 0.95 to 8.7, a pretty wide interval because our sample size was not that big. Now we can get the uh, Pearson chi-square test um, and uh, we have a frequency table X uh, that's just here. We could have used the table function in order to get that frequency table. And then we're going to use the chi-square test without the continuity correction. We get a chi-square of 3.7, a p-value of 0 0.054. Uh, don't say that that's not significant because we're really trying to banish the phrase significant, uh, not significant or significant. Um, so what about our interpretation? Well, we can compare the odds of death in emergency group to the odds of death in a non-emergency group, to, and we see a 2.87-fold higher chance, or higher odds of death with our confidence interval. Um, and so that is how you do the 2 by 2 comparison using uh, normal approximation. You see, it's pretty easy, and there's lots of software for doing
these things. Now what about with Fisher's exact test? Well we have these observed data but um, Fisher's test is going to condition on the marginal totals uh, so it's going to act like this 17 total deaths is something you could have preordained. Uh, so we're changing from an unconditional hypothesis for comparing two unconditional probabilities to now a conditional probability that conditions on observed marginals. Uh, now the Fisher's exact test is a really nice thing for statistics students to learn because it's a great exercise involving the hypergeometric distribution. Um, and you can calculate all possible tables and the probability of observing each table using the hypergeometric distribution. You add up all those probabilities, you get a p-value and a probability of observing data as or more extreme than what you collected in this experiment. Um, so to do Fisher's test, we, we can do it very easily here and um, we get a p-value that's bigger than what we got from the Pearson chi-square test is 0.087. You also get an odds ratio that's not the same one that we got. It's a conditional maximum likelihood estimate, not the one we really want. So this test is more conservative, not just because it has a larger p-value in this particular data set, but because it has larger p-values in general and the type 1 error is lower than what you claim it is. So in the next session, we're going to do these analyses in a completely different way that's also going to allow us to introduce logistic regression. Uh, you will think that it's a more complicated way to do it, but there's a lot of advantages because with logistic regression, you can compare proportions, but you can also do covert adjustment and you can do Bayesian uh, testing for uh, Bayesian comparisons for two proportions. So we're going to go through um, uh, introduction to logistic regression uh, next time and show how to do Bayesian logistic regression to compare two proportions. So I hope to see you next time and hope to have you enter in discussions on datamethods.org. Thanks.